I suspect this group is, is well aware of the numerous studies that indicate the, the potential economic impact of advancing women's equality. Uh, the McKinsey study from a few years back suggested that ambitious efforts in this direction could add some $12 trillion to go, global growth. I do believe there is growing global importance of advancing women's empowerment. Indeed, uh, we're seeing measures designed to address the issue increasingly embedded in our foreign policy and in the agendas of multilateral institutions. Globally, successive G7 and G20 presidencies have sought to address women and girls' empowerment, and most recently in May, we saw the G7 foreign and development ministers commit $15 billion in development finance over the next two years to help women in developing countries access jobs, uh, build business and respond to the impact of COVID-19. The empowerment of women and girls is a central part of the Biden administration's foreign policy. The US interim national security strategy that was issued earlier this year states that we will advance gender equality and women's empowerment as part of our broader commitment to inclusive economic growth and social cohesion. Now, I firmly believe that the U.S.-Denmark partnership is a tremendous vehicle for pursuing our shared interest in this critical objective. Uh, indeed, Vice President Harris and Prime Minister Meta Frederiksen spent considerable time talking about how to increase women's participation in the workforce during a telephone conversation earlier this year. It's clear, though, from multiple metrics, particularly post-pandemic, that we have much to do to achieve a a sustained economic recovery, we must vigorously advocate for policies that encourage and prepare women to assume leadership positions in the workplace and in society at large. So we look forward to the conversation today and in hearing thoughts on how we Americans and Danes can work together and leverage our experiences to advance a shared agenda. And I want to thank uh, all of the leaders who are contributing their expertise uh, and insight here today for their participation. And for our audience members, I hope that you will use this conversation uh, as a way to keep this discussion going within your own workplaces and in your own networks. So thank you for participating and I turn it back to Therese. Therese. Thank you, Stuart. Um, it's great to hear that uh, this issue is, is coming up so, so importantly on the uh, political agenda. So thanks for those words. Um, now I'm pleased to welcome our first keynote, uh, Elise Nelson, who's president and CEO of Vital Voices. And with her background in the U.S. State Department and the White House, she's been called one of the 150 women shaking the world by Newsweek and one of the 100 most influential people in global, gen global gender policy by Apolitical. Elise will present Vital Voices leadership model highlighting five core leadership practices of effective women change makers. Elise, welcome. Thank you, Therese. And uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be here and speaking to all of you. What I'm gonna be talking about today is really the lessons that I have learned, that we at Vita Voices has, have learned over the past 24 years of working with thousands of women leaders, 18,000 women leaders across 182 countries around the globe. And we began to see this model emerging about 15 years ago. And at that time, there was no research, there was no you know, sort of data that we could pull to say that absolutely this leadership model is the way to move forward. And so many women leaders that we were working with around the world who were on the front lines of change, whether it be in business, in politics, in civil society, in their communities, defending human rights and working for climate justice or racial equality, but what we found was that they didn't see themselves as leaders because what they saw as leadership were people at the top who didn't have those same qualities that they possessed of collaboration, of empathy. So I wanna first share with you a, um, a short video um, that really talks about how we have seen women rise to leadership positions. And then I'm gonna share with you this leadership model, these leadership practices and I hope that you throughout the presentation over the next 20 minutes, truly self-identify um, in some of these practices of what we're seeing. I am a woman. I am a woman. I am a woman, a single voice. Many have doubted what I'm capable of. But I saw a problem in my community. So the women of my country being left behind. 
the women in Kuwait did not have political rights. Women were getting raped and they were not getting any justice. I made a choice. I made a choice. I made a choice to take action. I've been able to get justice for child abuse victims. I help women and their families earn a living where they live. I've helped more than 27,000 women into business. I've mentored women so that they're now part of the decision-making process. We campaign to obtain full political rights. We've been able to... I made a film. 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 single voice. I am a single voice. I am a single voice. And I and I, and I, and I will be heard. So what we at Vital Voices have seen over the last 24 years that we have been doing this work is that when you invest in women, you invest truly in their communities and countries around the world. And what we do at Vital Voices is we search the world for women who have a daring vision for change, women who are tackling some of the world's greatest challenges, whether it be economic inequity or climate change or combating violence against women. And what we do is we provide them with the tools, the skills, the resources that they need, the connections with each other, the mentors that they need to take their bold vision to scale. One of the things that I believe is so deeply important is that you can only truly change what you know. So often we look externally at what other people are doing and thinking, okay, I need to adopt that to be able to lead change. But one of the things that we encourage women around the world is to really look inside at their own experiences, the challenges that they have seen because that is where leadership is born. So what I wanna tell you about, of course, is our leadership model. But first, I wanna explain why we do this work. Now, of course, you heard from Stuart how there is great data out there today. Um, and certainly this did not exist 24 years ago when we began our work on the heels of the United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women under the great leadership of then First Lady Hillary Clinton and uh, then Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. But what we know today is that 65 of the lowest income countries in the world would actually gain $92 billion a year if women and girls were educated just at the same level as boys and men, just at the same level, nothing more, just equal. We also know that communities and countries around the world globally in one year would gain $1.5 trillion if we could just end domestic violence. Think about that. All the challenges that we could solve with $1.5 trillion, close to the global GDP of Canada, right? And then finally, and I know Stuart mentioned one number, but this is actually a more updated number, which is $28 trillion. That's how much the world would gain by 2025 if women gained the same economic opportunities as men. When I began this work, it was very much about convincing people that it was the right thing to do, to invest in women and girls. After all, we're 51% of the population. We are not a special interest group. We're the majority. However, what I've come to realize is that armed with this data, we can really show people it's a win-win. We can show men that sharing power, sharing leadership and opportunity with women is a win-win. But what I've come to recognize over the years is that it's more than just a win-win. Women are not just an economic force to be tapped in their countries and communities. What we know and what we have discovered over the years is that women lead differently. And that difference is precisely what our world needs today. So if we think about traditional styles of leadership and often why women around the world will not recognize themselves immediately as leaders, because the traditional model of leadership they may be seeing, seeing is that one decision maker at the top. They've got the title, the position, the corner office, so many people reporting to them. They were born into it. They look the part and they think, well, I don't look the part. They know that they're mentors, they're supporting from underneath rather than pushing from down top. And so they didn't really see themselves as leaders. But what we began to see across 
all of these countries and communities and cultures and generations and socioeconomic backgrounds and religious beliefs is that there were these five common traits that truly exceptional leaders who were not just successful, but were truly making a significant impact in their communities possessed. And that's what I wanna share with you today because it really represents an emerging style of leadership that we are seeing sweeping the world. If you think about this past year, the leaders that were held up, you know, at, at a year when leadership was truly on display, there was nowhere you could hide as a leader. We saw the life and death consequences through a global pandemic, economic downturn, a rise of racial injustice, as well as violence against women. And during that time, the world calls for truly authentic leadership. And what we saw is that in countries around the world, as frontline healthcare workers, as community leaders, and yes, as heads of state, that it was women who, yes, were disproportionately negatively impacted by this crisis, but at the same time, we're stepping up with this new model of leadership, a model that is about empathy, that is about collaboration, and that at first is about listening to the people you support. So just to introduce you to this model, it has five core practices. First, a driving force or a sense of mission. We believe so strongly that leaders are called to make that change. You saw in the video, women have an experience. They tend to come to their leadership because they see a wrong in their community and they want to desperately step up to right it. Secondly, they have strong roots in the community. They truly understand those around them. They understand the people that they're leading and they go in listening rather than talking. They have an ability to connect across lines that divide. They're not afraid of people who think differently. They have bold ideas and bold action. They bring forth crazy out of the box ideas and everybody tells them they're crazy, but they are just that new bold thinking that's needed to make truly breakthrough change. And finally, and I wouldn't believe this if I didn't see it again and again and again, is that women have a resolve to pay it forward. When women gain opportunity, they immediately look around and say, who can I give this to? Who can I share this with? And that's what's so powerful. And that's how a network of 18,000 women around the globe that we support has impacted nearly 100 million people over the last 24 years. 100 million people from 18,000. That is the power of paying it forward and the power of understanding that, you know, power expands the moment it's shared. It does not disintegrate, it actually expands. So a driving force or sense of mission just to dig in deeper, and I must warn you, I normally spend about an hour digging into this, uh, digging into this model. So I'm trying to move quickly because I know we have limited time. And of course, I want to leave Sarah uh, time as well because she's a, got some really important information to impart. So a driving force or sense of mission. So I believe that all great leaders have a, a true mission statement, a true north. They have that personal experience. And what I find is that Women didn't necessarily, so many women we work with around the world, they didn't necessarily choose to be leaders. They weren't thinking their entire life, yes, I'm going to be the president of my country. In the thousands of interviews that I've done with women leaders, again and again, it goes back to a personal experience. They saw a wrong in their community, just like the film, and they wanted to step up to write it. That is how they became called to leadership. And that driving force, that sense of mission, keeps them focused. For me, my driving force is on my shirt today. It's truly to use your power to empower. So that is my mantra. That is what I check myself against as a leader. Am I using my power for my own benefit or am I using my power? What the resources I can pull together as the head of Vital Voices to empower women leaders and support women around the world. This is Amanda Gorman. You all know her, of course, because she's quite famous after she gave that extraordinary reading of her poem, 
um, and, and performance of her poem at the former, uh, at the, at the uh, last presidential inauguration of President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. And I think many of us thought, oh yes, you know, Kamala Harris, she's, you know, she'll steal the show, right? So exciting to have our first female vice president and also a, a woman who is both Asian American and a black American, truly exciting and breakthrough. But so many people after the inauguration were talking about Amanda and the extraordinary performance that she gave. And what you may not know about Amanda is that when she was growing up, she had a speech impediment and she was bullied and she was silenced because of that speech impediment. And so she tucked herself away in a room and she started reading and she read The Bluest Eye. And it was the first time that she saw herself in a story. And she realized that she could write stories about people who looked like her. And so she began to write and she found her voice through poetry. And her poetry was so good that it started winning competitions. And it was so good that they started saying, please come and perform. And so she did. Well, the rest is history. And so many years later, she's performing for a president on inauguration of the United States. She is also on the, on the uh, front part of the Vital Voices building. This is our global headquarters for women's leadership that will open next year if you're in Washington. But what is powerful about Amanda is that her weakness, right? Her, her supposed weakness, that she had a speech impediment was actually her strength. She believes that her voice is her superpower. So when we think about our driving force, it is not something that comes from perfection. It is something that comes from experience. And sometimes it can be traumatic experience that shook us to the core that we said, I don't want anyone else to face this. But it is those decisions that we've made over time that have shaped us and our communities. These are just some examples of a driving force from other women leaders that, um, that we have worked with to be part of the solution to end modern day slavery, providing cleaner energy solutions through recycling to make game changing impact on the world of education. One of the things that I encourage all people to think about is what is my mission statement? Not the mission statement of my organization, but the mission statement of my life. Because what people are desperately seeking right now is leaders who understand that. Leaders who authentically stand for something and are their word, they will stay standing for those issues. Deep roots in the community really builds upon that first practice. Deep roots in the community is all about understanding your people. More and more, we hear leaders talking about the value of empathy. But I can tell you 10 years ago, five years ago, maybe even three years ago, people thought of empathy as something weak, but it is one of the most powerful traits of a leader to be able to put yourself in someone's shoes. So there was a recent study done that showed that the difference between men and women as leaders is that the higher they climb, women, no matter how high they are, they could be the CEO of a major company, they never stop asking for feedback. They want to know how they're doing, how people perceive them. They want to listen. Where at a certain point, men actually stop asking for feedback. Now, I hate to make blanket statements. Obviously, there are men who continue to ask for feedback. But by and large, women continue to ask for feedback at a higher rate, the higher they rise than men do. I think that's extremely important because again, we are all deeply connected around the world through social media and technology. Soon all of us will be connected, but yet people feel disconnected from their leaders. They feel their leaders do not represent them. They feel they move from this issue to that. And I think as women, we need to remember that, you know, we need to let that inner voice of ours come out. I think for so long when I would interview women leaders, they would say, you know, oh, no, 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 I'm no different. I'm no different as a leader, you know, just because I'm a woman. I'm no different. I'm no different. And now I think women are starting to embrace that. Yeah, we're different. We are different. We've had different experiences. But that difference is precisely what our world needs. And notice I didn't say better. In my opinion, we need men and women working together because we bring different strengths and attributes to the table. 
This is Buthena Camel. She is a, a wonderful uh, leader uh, in the Middle East. In Egypt, when uh, a number of years ago, nearly 10 years ago now, when there was the political uprising, she took to the streets. And she knew that the people wanted change. And so she decided that she would throw her hat in the ring to run for president of her country. And she traveled all around the country to you know, learn from the people because she knew she needed to go on that listening tour. She needed to hear from the people. It was the people that called for this revolution and the new head of the country needed to have their voices in their head. She didn't win, but she was the only political candidate that did this and she changed the face of politics. The ability to connect across lines that divide is the third practice of the model. This is about putting ego aside, understanding that if we don't work with people who we disagree with on 99 things, but can come together on that one thing, we can't make sustainable change. So as we know, we on our own, it's hard to make change, right? Truly lasting, sustainable change. But it is also hard to make truly lasting, sustainable change if we only work with people who agree with us. It's why in this country, laws are co-sponsored by Republicans and Democrats across those political aisles. What we've seen, whether it be Northern Ireland or Somalia or here in the United States, women coming together at those times when you know, we're in an impasse as a country, women coming together behind closed doors, building trust, whether it be in South Africa or in India or in Israel or in Northern Ireland. Women basically saying like this woman did, Inez McCormick, enough is enough. In Northern Ireland, there had been too much death, too many murders of uh, women and children, but certainly of men. Too many men were dying in a bloody civil war. And she decided to bridge those divides. And a generation later, a generation later, her children's generation were able to sit down at those peace negotiation tables and hammer out the Good Friday Peace Accords. But it was the women who built that infrastructure within the community to support the peace process. The fourth practice of our leadership model is really bold ideas and bold action. And this is just the idea that quite frankly, there's a benefit to historically being left out. I know that sounds crazy, but actually it is because you think about, we bring different ideas to the table. Where our world is right now, we are not going to move forward using the same old strategies. We need new and innovative ideas and we need thinkers that are not currently at decision-making tables. So this is a wonderful woman we've worked with over the years, Penmela Castro. And what she's from Brazil and what she began to see is that yes, there was a law on the books that said that domestic violence was a crime, but no one respected it. She herself was a victim of domestic violence, but at the time she had no idea there was a law. When she called the police, they said, what are you talking about? That's cultural, you know, that's private. We don't answer those calls. And so she decided she'd take to the streets, to the favelas of Rio where she grew up and she would put her graffiti art out there to communicate to people that there was no place for beating a woman in a modern society. She raised awareness, but she also was able to engage the police in working with and alongside the people that actually implement that law in the book. Because quite frankly, if we want to move forward in terms of equality between men and women, one, men have to be involved, but two, it's about cultural change, behavioral change. And she uses her art and her culture to shift that culture and that behavioral change. One of the things that we know in the past year is that women lost a generation, an entire generation, 35 years of progress. We need to gain that back. And how are we going to do that? It's now gonna take at current rates, 135 years for women to gain equality with men. I don't accept that. I'm sure you don't as well. We know that women bring great opportunities and new ideas and thinking. And what we need is precisely those ideas to not only move forward in terms of equality, but to move forward in terms of progress and you know, dealing with issues like 
climate change and hunger, innovative, crazy, bold ideas. And what we encourage is women to believe in their gut. Even if 100 people tell you you're wrong, we'll be the people who tell you, try it, you're right. It may be the very thing that breaks through this, the blockage that we're having. Finally, a resolve to pay it forward. As I said before, again and again and again, what we see is that when women gain power and access and opportunity, they immediately think about who do I give it to? Who do I share it with? And unfortunately, this is not what you know, we're told. We're told, oh, women pull the ladder up after them. That is not what I have seen. I have been with Vital Voices now for 24 years. I have been mentored, I have been supported by thousands of women around the world, but in this country as well. In fact, I wouldn't be in my position as CEO if it wasn't for the former chair of the board, Milan Revere, who then became the first global ambassador for women's issues, who truly believed in me. And I think that as leaders, we have to recognize not only are people watching us as women and how we act and how we lead and emulating that, but we also have not only an opportunity, but a responsibility to give back and to truly enable the world to understand that the only meaningful measure of power is the extent of its positive impact. So thank you all for letting me join you and share some of these insights and Teresa, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks, Elise. Um, really, really amazing what uh, what your work with Vital Voices is doing, and um, and I know that uh, in the discussion later we're going to touch a lot upon the um, uh, the change of the traditional leadership models. So thank you very much for that. Um, and now I'd like to uh, introduce our second keynote, uh, Sarah Enline, who is entrepreneur in residence at Harvard Business School and the Harvard Innovation Labs as well as founder and CEO of activist candy company, Sweet Riot New York City. Her entrepreneurial work has been covered by the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Today Show, Forbes, and Fortune. Sarah will share her experiences on what organizations can do to support the advancement of women and shape a gender inclusive culture, as well as how business leaders can actively champion female talent and create opportunities for advancement. Sarah, welcome. Thank you so much. So wonderful to be here. And I'm so sorry we're not together. I just wanted to give you a little symbol that we miss you here in New York and in the US. Please visit as soon as you can. And I hope to see you all in Denmark as well. I'm going to share my screen. Wonderful to be be here and thank you so much for joining. I just wanted to first, let's acknowledge Elise and just the amazing work that she's been doing for so many years. Um, she's, the, she's the real expert, I'll say. I'm just going to share some of my experiences, but thank you so much, Elise, for everything you just shared. So I'm gonna talk more from a personal basis of what I've learned as a business leader and as a serial social entrepreneur. And then I will share some academic learning and institu institutional view from Harvard. So first of all, one of my mantras is certainly, whether we call this empathy or understanding, um, luckily either it was high school or college, I caught Stephen Covey and the seven habits of, of effective people. And I really held on to this mantra more than any, um, to seek first to understand. And that's how I approach really leadership and this whole space of kind of gender and inclusion and understanding. So I'll give you a few things I learned along the way. I grew up in a small town and one of my first African-American friends was really at the University of Michigan. And I remember trying to convince him that I was colorblind and he said, please don't say that. Um, I want you to acknowledge that we're different. And I need to acknowledge that you know, that's okay, let's learn about each other. So then I stripped that language. Then I thought I was gender blind um, for a long time. I was always in 50-50 situations. I was leading as a woman. I, I didn't really see a bro culture, a male culture at all around me until I moved to Silicon Valley. And that was my first experience where I was like, I, I thought I was gender blind. And then suddenly I was in the room and sometimes you know, more silent than kind of speaking because it was such a male dominated culture. 
And I think that's when I realized I needed to open my eyes and really kind of look at myself as a woman and as a leader and how was I going to embrace diversity and really lift it up. And when I started Sweet Riot, I had all these incredible young women that wanted to work with me because they were also looking for female leadership. And I started to dig into this further when I became an entrepreneur in residence at Harvard. And I realized we were really using the word inclusion, not diversity, because diversity in our world is a fact. There are so many incredible people, you know, small and large and tall and short and black and white and all different colors and male and female. It's let's not debate divert diversity. It's here, right? It's inclusion that is the choice. And so really going forward for me, it was about how do I drive inclusion as a leader? How do I acknowledge the diversity is already there? What am I going to do to act upon inclusion? So I love this next mantra, which actually also relates to Vital Voices because Madeline was a founder of Vital, Vital Voices voices, which is there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. And so as I continued on this journey of, wait, I'm not going to be colorblind. I'm not going to be gender blind. It's not just about diversity. It's actually about inclusion being our choice. For me, it was very important to also take on the mantra of, I am always going to support other women around me. I want to lift them up and support them on their own journey. For me, the journey really, and again, I'm, I'm an individual entrepreneur at this point and entrepreneurs are always looking for resources and you're out often fighting the fight on your own, looking for the right team and the right people. For me, that fight for inclusion was to find some of the right support groups. And when I say right support groups, they had to be these women's organizations that had that mantra of Madeline and who were nothing but positive energy. There were no hallway conversations about people or this kind of um, operation behind the scenes. It was always positive energy and amazing forward-looking thinking from the very beginning. So luckily I found some of these groups. And as a female entrepreneur, I encourage other entrepreneurs to find support systems. It started first with this small organization, organization Ladies Who Launch in New York City for you know, really micro businesses. It went on to an organization, Count Me In, which today it, it doesn't exist, but it was about helping women drive their businesses to a million plus. It then moved into Springboard, which is an incredible organization that started around the time of Vital Voices, also based in DC and all about helping women raise capital. And then I joined Dallas Women's Entrepreneurship Network. So for me, it was important to surround myself with other women and organizations that wanted to lift me and lift everyone around them. The other thing that I've done along the way is I really believe in educating yourself, reading. I still read broadsheets today. It's a great roundup of all of these empowering articles. Um, and then Harvard has a gender initiative, which always has cutting edge research and ideas. And so why am I sharing this? Because I fundamentally believe this journey starts first with you. So I've literally taken you through a very quick example of my own journey, because the journey in my view, if you're not starting out with a sense of empathy and seeking to understand as you embark on this journey of inclusion, it will be very challenging. If you're judging others and not taking a look at yourself first, I think it's very hard to drive change and to lead change. So those are my examples of from the small town to kind of going through this journey of life when for a long time, I was barely in Harvard's Women's Student Association because I thought, I don't need that. I'm okay. I'm here, you know, I'm playing with everyone and leading, you know, men and women. And then again, you'll encounter, or I encountered some experiences in my life where I really had to think much more deeply about my gender and about driving inclusion. Now, I'm going to share a story of an academic fight for inclusion, very different kind of approach. This is not an opinion. This is literally me sharing a case study 
of what Harvard Business School did when they were going down their own road of fighting for inclusion. First, the ch change really began at the top. So imagine the CEO of the school is the dean. For the first time ever, there was a non-white male Indian American named to be the dean. He was a minority at the school. And then he chose a brand new leadership team. I like to call it the Benetton team that he chose. And he pulled on stage himself and three incredible women leaders at the school, all of whom looked different. And he put this team in charge of the school for the first time ever. One of them was a real visionary professor and one of my first professors at the school. So she's mentored me on, on what the school did. Um, and he chose this new associate dean, Frances Fry. And she knew there was a gender gap, but she's an academic. And so she wasn't using her opinion. She just started to study. And she started to study and look at the data and say, where are the achievement gaps? What's really behind them? Why are women achieving lower grades? And why are women, female professors achieving less tenure? For her, it was very much about research. These women were entering the school as students with the same statistics and the same achievements as men. And then they were receiving lower grades. For her, as an academic, she had to solve the mystery. So she first went after, why would the class grades be less? The women did fine on the tests, on par with the men. But in class participation, which counts for 50% of your grade at Harvard Business School, they were lagging behind. Again, she wasn't looking for opinions and debating this. She was looking at the data, trying to figure out what was going on behind the scenes. What she learned is that the way professors were tracking the commentary in the classroom was often by just making manual notes. They literally didn't have even a digital or a tech system to track all the commentary in the classroom. And this counted for 50% of one's grades. So what she was able to do is encourage the school to literally invest in new technology so that there was an instant way of tracking who was speaking in that classroom. And the professor didn't have to recall by memory or handwritten note of what Joe or Susie said. Instead, they received the digital notes afterwards to protect against any bias. This is an interesting one. She also realized that women were raising their hands differently. So when you're in a classroom, the professor says, does someone have a comment? And half the class goes like this, but the women sit back. Guess what happens? They may be called upon less. So she created workshops literally to help women participate in a stronger way in the classroom. She found when she did these workshops that foreign language speakers came, all minorities came to these workshops because they wanted to learn how to kind of be in this environment and to perform more successfully. So guess what happened? The grade gap was completely closed based on these small measures. She then decides, I have to figure out why are the professors, why is there a tenure gap? Why were they brought in incredible PhDs, incredible professors to teach, but their, te their tenure would be based on teaching performance and research and publishing. She wanted to understand, not based on opinion, but based on looking at the data, why would this be? Why is there a gap? First of all, she figured out that again, to get tenure, it was about your research reports, your published research reports, and it was about your classroom performance. Female professors were perfectionists. They would sit on these reports and they would kind of hold them longer, not always even share their drafts until they felt they were perfect. What she was able to do was create a system where there was a much stronger feedback loop and the female professors were encouraged to share early and often 
these draft research reports, to get the feedback, to not hold them until they were perfect, but to share them frequently to try and receive the critical feedback that was needed to create a really wonderful research report. The second thing she did, and this is an interesting one, is she realized there was one way that the school gave feedback to professors and they would take videos of the teaching and then give it to the professors after and say, look, here's a video of you teaching. You, sh you, can, you can get better now. The videos helped the men. She found that the videos did not help the women. The women would watch videos of themselves teaching and, and self-criticize, or maybe they think, oh, I didn't look perfect that day for teaching, or they just, the videos were not helping them improve. So she changed the way that the new female professors were given feedback. It was not via, hi, here's a video of you teaching, this can help you be better. Instead, it was literally private coaching, not necessarily sharing a video, but having someone else look at the video and say, I found this and giving them very particular constructive feedback to that female professor, sometimes after every class. And by doing that, it really helped the female professor improve. So what are the takeaways? And they cross really from the female student to the female professor. Women are hard on themselves. They're perfectionists. And I know Elise knows this from the work she's done. So they're, they're delaying themselves in raising their hand. Am I perfect enough? They're delaying themselves in, in sharing that research report, turning in that assignment. And certainly, we, many of us have probably read the articles of how the woman won't go for the job promotion, but the guy will, right? So the sense of being a perfectionist is real and it showed up in these classroom experiences. Women are slower to raise their hands in the classroom. And this can, so this is a microcosm of the world. Imagine the classroom is like a boardroom or a business meeting. And so if you're not jumping in at the same rapid rate of speed or the way maybe the man might, will your voice be heard? And so this is women raise their hands slower. Again, I'm generalizing, but this is based on one institution's study. The other thing that she found is that organizations that recruit women and minorities in larger groups, it seemed to integrate more seamlessly, bring people together in these organizations so that they don't feel alone. So when she would do the work with classroom participation, she would have all these people in the room together supporting each other. And this was really important to then lift the entire classroom. She also believes, and Elise addressed this, that you make the world better for women and, and you make it better for everyone, for sure. Um, moms especially have this kind of natural caretaking tendency. And so if you're lifting moms and lifting women, you'll get this sense of positive impact on an entire group, which I think you heard it from Elise as well. This is never about not lifting men. It's about lifting everyone. And it's about celebrating and recognizing our differences. Uh, the other thing is it's messaging is, is cannot be one size fits all, right? It's something that may work really well for a man, like the feedback system of sharing a video really might not work as well for a woman. And we've got to dig into what are the achievement gaps we have at our organizations and our institutions and what might be some simple fixes that we can do to get ourselves over these grade gaps, these achievement gaps. And again, this is a comment from Francis. It's it's not a bias against women among men. It's, it's really about training. It's about awareness of differences. And I'll end by just saying, um, it's, it's about celebrating, celebrating the differences, embracing them. And I, sh I have this article from Inc, which I appreciate, which is what, what can we all do? And point five to me is one of the most important points is again, we want men and women together at the table discussing inclusion. It's not a debate about diversity. It really isn't. 
we have an incredible, beautiful world of so many different shapes and sizes. It's about how do we ourselves personally understand? And then how do we look at our institutions and think about are your institutions driving inclusion and are there fixes that we can do to ensure that they are? Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. That's wonderful. And thank you so much for sharing both your personal experience as well as the Harvard case study. You certainly bring up a lot of interesting points. And I know that uh, we are going to hit on a lot of those uh, points in the uh, discussion with Marie. So with that, I'll let um, I'll introduce um, our, uh, our panel moderator, a diversity and inclusion expert Marie Valentin Beck, who will set the scene for the panel discussion. Marie has 15 years exp experience in diversity and inclusion, and her company, Bureau M, advises companies on developing their diversity strategies through leadership training and advisory practice. Marie, welcome. Thank you so much, Therese. And thank you, Elise, and thank you, Sarah, for two very informative and very inspirational presentations. There were so many important takeaways um, on both a personal and a professional level. So thank you for that. It is now my pleasure to guide through a panelist discussion where we will focus on what the US and Denmark can learn from each other in terms of elevating women into leadership, be it in a corporate context as an entrepreneur or as a vision um, for a modern leadership. This entails trying to get an understanding of what obstacles to having more women in leadership are tied to each country's society, the national and economic structures and the work culture and the social norms. Because as numbers show, there are obstacles indeed, um, but they seem to play out differently in the US and Denmark respectively. So uh, let's have a look at the numbers Martin, can you uh, please share my slides? So these numbers are from the latest survey called the Global Gender Index. That's an annual survey done by the World Economic Forum. Uh, it measures each country's level of gender equality on a range of parameters. Some of them are very relevant for today's topic. So what we see here is um, the, what I've called the state of the unions. So can you, that one, yes, thank you. So overall, when you combine all the parameters, USA and Denmark rank almost equally on this index, being USA being um, number 30 and Denmark being number 29. It should be noted here that the, the other Scandinavian Nordic countries are in the top seven of this list. When we zoom in on the parameter called legislators, senior officials and managers, the US ranks number 29 and Denmark ranks number, number 101. Zooming in on the parameter called labor force participation rate, we can see on the other hand that USA ranks number 61, whereas Denmark ranks number 25. So there are some very clear differences that we will come back to later on. Can you uh, take the next slide, please? So OECD has been measuring um, the share of female entrepreneurs in all its member countries. And it shows that USA has a rate of 16.6% uh, that leaves at number two out of 25 countries. And Denmark has 4.2% uh, female entrepreneurs, which uh, places us on a solid number 23 out of 25. The average is 9.2%. Um, so when these numbers are compared, a lot, of a lot of questions arise. And the most important to one today being, what can the US and Denmark learn from each other when it comes to elevating more women into leadership? So let's discuss just that. And with us to have that discussion is our two uh, keynote speakers, Elise Nelson and Sarah Endline, as well as two experienced leaders from Denmark and Scandinavia. I will let them introduce themselves, beginning with Christine Asmussen. She is the executive director of Finansforbund at Nordea Bank, where she worked with political stakeholder relations 
as international, European and Nordic levels to build networks and create alliances. Welcome, Christine. So much, Marie, and thank you, Kohi. Uh, it's very, I'm very happy to participate here. And also thank you to Elise and Sarah for some extremely inspiring keynote speeches. I really took a lot of notes. Thank you very much. And the reason why this topic of elevating women into leadership positions is interesting to me, and you could even say that actually it intrigues me, is that instead of progressing, Denmark is in fact falling behind, as Marie has already mentioned in the numbers you've given us. I have myself been a leader for 30 years, and I'm not a leader, but I've been on the labor market, and for many years I believe that with time, we will see more women progress into leadership positions. But that has not happened, at least not to a great extent. In the finance sector where I work, approximately 50% of staff are women and 50% are men. However, only 26% of the leaders in the sector are women. And only 50% uh, of the female leaders think that there are numerous, numerous female talents. But this number is only 32% if you took if you ask many leaders what they see as talent. And only eight out of 90 board director members are women. You can say Denmark is in many aspects a country with ambitions, a progressive country. In this area, we should certainly be more ambitious. And why do we then need diversity and inclusion? One reason is that the research shows us that diversity in top management enforces the business, it creates increased innovation power, and better decisions are simply made. And furthermore, I think it's extremely important to say that 50% of the world's population, they are women. And this number should absolutely be reflected in the number of women we find in leadership positions. Lastly, um, how do I lead to increase diversity and inclusion? And I think that was actually great for me to get this question because it started me to reflect a bit. Um, I would say, first of all, we are all biased. I am also biased. And I try to be very conscious about my own biases. And I use that, for example, when I recruit and also in other situations so that I can make better decisions and, for example, have a team, create a team that is more diverse and inclusive. Thank you very much. I'm looking very much forward to this quick debate. Thank you, Christine. Um, and uh, Christine, I will have to ask you to move a little bit closer to the microphone in order to, to hear you uh, better. Um, next, we have Peter Anderlin. He is the senior vice president at Danske Bank, where he serves at, as the HR manager for the large corporate and institutions business unit. Peter is also the co-head of the Divisions Diversity and Inclusion and Culture Councils, Council and sits on the HR management team. Prior to joining Danske Bank, Peter worked um, for Credit Suisse and Goldman Sachs based out of Zurich, London and New York. Welcome, Peter. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Or do I need yes. to move closer? I apologize about these big headphones, but... Um... Well, thank you very much for being part of this as well. It's been uh, a motivating and insightful uh, session thus far and have also taken a lot of notes. Um, given that international background and uh, working in HR, uh, getting uh, the, the ambition of getting a, a more gender balanced uh, leadership has been a constant focus for me. And I, when I moved from Switzerland to Denmark, I actually naively thought that this topic would be less pronounced as we were getting to the Nordics with this was some a solution, but I, I found out uh, that that's not true. And it's actually the, 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 the opportunity and the focus on this is even more pronounced here um, in, in Danske Bank than it was in Switzerland, which has its own structural um, challenges and opportunities. But that was a, a, a real lesson for me. Um, I, 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 I care deeply about this topic um, of course, there's a lot of literature that talks about the advantage of diversity in terms of yielding better uh, ideas and, and solutions to clients, uh, but I also think we, we need to mirror our clients and uh, we don't do that currently well enough. 
Um, I also think we are able to attract and retain uh, more talent through having a more inclusive workforce. And when we don't have that, the, the cost is we don't, and a lot of focus is spent then on, on further work around retaining and attraction, which it becomes a little bit iterative. Um, and also, I mean, I, I just personally, I, I think it's more fun um, and fulfilling to work in an organization and a team that, that uh, has more um, uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, also, I mean, I think just on a personal level, I'm a proud father um, to, a, to a wonderful daughter and I don't accept uh, that she would have um, lesser opportunities uh, than, than my sons. It just it doesn't make sense to me. Um, and finally, I mean, just selfishly, I'm, I'm spending, uh, and when I say I, also many uh, leaders uh, at Tessing Bank are probably spending up to 40, 50% of our day focusing on diversity and inclusion topics in one way or the other. And being able to have this solved somehow and being able to allocate time to other priorities uh, would be obviously a, a huge opportunity. I, I think at the same time that what I'm encouraged by is that the, the focus and attention and personal uh, attention on this uh, in, in leadership is getting more and more pronounced. It's always been there, but it's, it's uh, more of a topic uh, and higher up on the agenda. So I'm, I'm um, hopeful about that. Uh, when, I, when I say I spend time on, on diversity and inclusion, it's either on transactional aspects to individuals, but otherwise it's really trying to build um, some fundamental um, processes and structures uh, to, to strengthen the pipeline of senior leaders and women leaders, or it's about, um, so to give an example, it could be about hiring, uh, both um, uh, about the junior hiring and, and making sure that we get a balanced um, pipeline uh, at the, from a graduate level. It's a really also on the senior level, we get a relatively few CVs from females or women. Uh, I think last time I checked uh, for last month, it was around 73% male CVs. So it's about really trying to push uh, and, and um, spend the time to make sure that we canvas uh, the opportunities before we commit. Um, it's also about advancements. And I, I think advancements on one hand, just technically make sure our succession plans are balanced um, and when they're not uh, challenged where appropriate, but it's also challenging some of the, the, the biases that happen naturally in, a, in quite a masculine culture as for example, what is, if we wanna be meritocratic, what is uh, a talent? And is it more than um, some of the profiles that tend to be more masculine? Um, and, and it's really reviewing that uh, at that level. Be, it's also about retention, understanding what are the retention factors. And I think uh, given the relative uh, low base of female leaders is really paying attention and make sure that we understand that we, we act on the retention factors that matter. And finally, it's about the culture. So to drive a more inclusive culture and controlling some of the natural biases that we all have, including myself. And I think in terms of, uh, uh, Elisa mentioned about the bold actions. I think some of the things we need to do better or more on is uh, I think related to this topic of, of being more courageous in terms of defining what leadership means. It's about um, the, the flexibility of the work arrangements for the past um, 16 months relating to COVID that's an opportunity. Let's make sure that we use that to strengthen um, the, the more inclusive culture. And, and I think there's a risk, maybe we, it could work the other way, but it's in being focused on that. And also things like parental leave, let's make sure that uh, we are balanced and that uh, males take on those opportunity as courageously as males, as, as uh, women do, uh, which is a little bit of a challenge in our environment and it's, it, it requires role modeling, et cetera. But I'm very happy to be here in the panel. I'll, I'll try to be as, informative and supportive as I can. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Peter, for that. Before we embark on the discussion, I will ask uh, all of your speakers to keep your microphone on for the entire duration of uh, the discussion. And if you wish to comment on each other, so uh, then please use the hand raising function on Zoom. To our audience, um, you are more than welcome to ask a question during this um, panel discussion. If you wish to do so, please use the chat function and we will direct the question to the speakers. Um, we will take questions during the discussion, so please feel free to engage. And if you have a question for a specific panelist, please name him or her in your question. So, I would like to start off with talking a little bit about this phenomenon called the Nordic paradox. Um, 
Denmark, along with other Nordic countries, are front runners when it comes to providing women with equal opportunities, affordable childcare, free education, and so forth. But still in this society, with a strong safety net, top management level, as well as entrepreneurship is vastly male dominated. In the Nordics, we have much to the admiration of gender equality advocates in, for example, the US tried to solve the problem for years by offering flexibility and a better work-life balance. And the past years has also been an increased focus on encouraging uh, paternity leave as a measure to level the playing field and to share and give value to uh, caregiving as well, of course. And the truth is that these initiatives are much needed um, because when it comes to women in leadership in Denmark, things are moving not only at a slow pace, but also in the wrong direction. Denmark has been dropping down uh, the global gender index since 2006. And this paradox is what is called the Nordic mystery by the uh, economist uh, in an article who, um, and it will be shared in the, in the chat function for you to read if you wish so. Um, and they wondered how come this quote unquote egalitarian flame that burns so brightly at the bottom of society splutters at the top of business. And because there is an egalitarian flame burning brightly in Denmark, but, but what happens to that flame when it comes to actual results? Looking at the numbers from the US, it is tempting to ask if having less of a safety net makes risk taking more tolerable for everyone in terms of becoming an entrepreneur or leader, or perhaps more fundamentally, are we fighting the wrong battle? Instead of only paying attention to how we can elevate women into leadership, should we also spotlight how leadership can be elevated by women? So I'm very curious to hear your comments on that. What is at play here? Um, are women in the US forced to make necessary choices early on if they want a career that women don't have to make? Um, Elise, would you care to comment on that as the first one? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think I think it goes back to um, cultural change, behavioral change, um, because I think you can put a lot of these safety nets in place. And I think if you ask women leaders around the world what is missing to move us forward, it's not so much the laws on the books, the safety nets. What it actually is is about that cultural behavioral change. Just speaking from my own experience, I have two children. Both times when I went on maternity leave, my husband's company offered paternity leave. But when it came to taking it, there was a lot of peer pressure mm -hmm. in the organization for him not to take it, right? So again, it goes back to that behavioral change. Yeah, paternity leave's offered. But if men don't take it, that's the problem. And I forced him to take it. <laughs> <laughs> being the feminist that I am and understanding that if he doesn't take it, it sets up right from the beginning, a paradigm where I'm the default. And in a household where my husband and I work, we travel, we're both working on social justice issues. So we are both extremely passionate about what we do and know and understand each other's passion in that, which is, which is valuable. But I think that needs to be set up right from the beginning. And so I think what I would, would figure out how to encourage is how do you create that cultural change? And I think for those leaders at the top, and I'm now speaking to male leaders at the top, I think to, to, to show that, you know, it's not going to come from words, it's going to come from action. And I think this is where men are absolutely critical to women's advancement and leadership. It is not going to happen without men as allies. 300%, I am sure of this. And so I think men at the top can use their platform, their voice, but most importantly, their example um, to create you know, a, a more level playing field uh, for women, really to model that in their actions, take the paternity leave. Um, and take it very visibly and very proudly and encourage others to do the same. So that kind of safety net can actually be a, 
a, an elevating function to more women in leadership. We don't need less of a safety net in order to have more women in leadership. I don't think you need less of a safety net. You know, what I don't know from the context of, of, of Denmark is, you know, you mentioned, does the safety net, um, does it provide too much safety and not enough, you know, sparking risk? And so, I, you know, that I, you know, from your perspective, I don't know that, but I think that is a really important point is if there's a, if there are so much safeties, is it encouraging risk? And what we know is that you can't lead without risk. Risk is absolutely critical to leadership. Mm. And so I think, you know, I would also potentially look at, you know, ways where women in leadership positions um, can talk about the risks that they've taken um, and really spotlighting women who've taken risks you know, both, you know, as we all know, risk can sometimes lead to success and it can sometimes, you know, not go the way you had planned and potentially lead to failure. But what I 100% know from my own failures is that it's not the opposite, really that, you know, failure is a step in the right direction towards mm -hmm. success, so. Thank you. Christine, you had a comment? Yes, I, 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 I'm, can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Yes, yes perfect. Um, first of all, I would like to say I'm extremely proud of the welfare system we have in Denmark. So I would find it really devastating if we had to roll back on that. But I do think there is a problem because um, patern maternity leave or paternity leave is a really good example of an area where uh, you're actually creating unbalance or imbalance. Because if you have two candidates mm -hmm. for the same position, you're sitting there as an employer having to hire somebody and you have uh, two, a man and a woman in the ages of, let's say, 29, 30 years old. They don't have any kids, but they probably would like kids. Um, and um, you know that if it's a woman, she might be away from, from work if she uh, takes maternity leave for 10, maybe 12 months. And it's a man, maybe he's away for one month, uh, maybe two months, something like this. It's absolutely something that, of course, you consider when you're an employer. So I think it would be a great leap if we would talk about equal division of, for example, maternity and paternity leave. So there wouldn't be this question you have to consider as an employer when you're sitting in that situation, but there will be an equal, uh, let's say, access to leave combined with having children. And then there's all the other consequences, which are very positive, of course, also for the kid to be more with their dad when they're young and all these things. So I think that those are the, the issues we need to discuss. Not that we have to lower to some lower level, not at all, but the distribution has to be different. It has to be balanced. Thank you, Christine. Um, I, um, I also wanted to ask about the way we lead and create businesses. So um, in this forum, it goes without saying that women should claim it and be, giving, be given a seat at the table. But the message proposed today from our keynote speakers and also from our Danish panelists um, might be that this table is broken and instead women should insist on building a new one. Is that so? And uh, how do you do that if you are already working in a corporation and not at the absolute top management um, or in a startup situation? Sarah, would you care to comment on that? You yes. had a great example of, of a, 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 a leader doing just that at Harvard. So I'll, I'll speak especially to the entrepreneurship point because I think what you see, and, and it's interesting to see the statistics in, in Denmark. I agree with the, the change in social programs, but to Lisa's point, you still need this cultural shift of people embracing these changes, celebrating these changes. So there's a very interesting study that came out about female entrepreneurs raising capital, which capital is an important part of the equation. Women are asked what's called prevention questions and men are asked promotion questions. This is a great study. We can put it in the chat. Um, it, it's in the Harvard Business Review, but it discusses how when a woman is sitting there raising capital, they're getting more negative questioning. And when the man's sitting there raising capital, he's getting all these like promotional positive questions about the business. So this cultural shift of, we wanna see women in business, 
Mm. We want to see it's okay to be a working mom or a working entrepreneur with children. It, this, this idea, even in, in our media and our conversations that we're celebrating this is so critical. And it's such a, it's, it feels like such a nuance. Um, but imagine you're trying to raise capital and the man next to you receives a totally different set of questions for the same business. It, it, it's just, it's not fair. So the other thing I would layer on to that is through the Springboard program, they even have to talk to women about how are we out talking about our businesses. So women often tend to downplay the numbers, downplay their achievements, downplay their titles. And it, it's not really the right approach when you're trying to raise capital. So here's a great example. I remember when I went into this, this coaching workshop about raising capital, I said something like, I did marketing at Yahoo in the past. And they said, listen, the way we really need you to talk about it is you did marketing and product design for millions of consumers mm. with some metrics around it. Actually, it's a big deal what you did. And I was underplaying it. And so men and women even go and speak about things, speak about capital, speak about entrepreneurship in different ways. And so we need to make that shift forward as well. Thank so you. Marie, um, there's a question from the chat that I think uh, maybe is, uh, is, a, is uh, relevant to this. And, and that is a question maybe, uh, maybe Pilla can answer, but uh, men, men can help with women's empowerment. Can you suggest some specific actions that men can take to encourage and embrace women in leadership roles? Uh, yes, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, and I'll be curious from the other panel members. I think uh, what I um, what I think uh, was alluded here a little bit that uh, if you're working in a very masculine environment such such as the one I'm working on, maybe there's less of a a, 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 a confidence to put yourself forward. And it's kind of like the squeaky wheel who are, who are always considered maybe more. And I think we, we need to drive a little bit of a culture where we believe in the potential in everyone and that we push ourselves to have the discussions with everyone about what is your aspiration and where do you want to get to, um, regardless male and female. Uh, but you, you need to have that discussion and not just on the one that is someone knocking on the door. And uh, if you understand that aspiration, it's really for you as a manager to reflect on how you can enable and support that. Uh, and I, I think um, that's one way to get it and, and really believe in the potential of all the employees and doing that a little bit in a gender neutral way. But I think that if we push for that, what, what we'll avoid again is, uh, is just that the, the same people always again are getting the type of attention which are maybe more explicitly uh, extroverted or, 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 or confident to show the, the attention. Uh, because I, I think that uh, in our organization, we don't see necessarily the role models uh, as as uh, frequently um, in a balanced way. Uh, and therefore there is maybe less aspirations um, or perception that aspirations are maybe less realistic uh, if you're a woman than you are a man. And I think that we need to just make sure that those conversations happen. Thank you, Pilar. Elise, um, you raised your hand. Uh, you can comment on this or you can comment on what was we, we talked about just before about uh, if women should insist on and building a new table and how do they do that if they're not in the absolute defining mm. role? Yeah. Mm. Well, one of the things that I think is really important for employers and bosses, leaders to think about right now is that there've been a number of studies that show that we are coming up on a tsunami of turnover, right? In our organizations. Now, why? Why would we have turnover? People leaving companies, going elsewhere, people seeking new jobs. Why would that be happening? One, because during a pandemic, people didn't want to leave their current jobs and look for something else. Maybe there was even less available with the economic downturn. Two, people being at home, maybe having more time or less time, as the case may be, to, to think about their lives and what they wanted. But then three, employers not offering the flexibility. So as I've been talking to a number of top women leaders in major companies, you know, uh, one of the things that they have said is that the men in the company in top executives' jobs are desperate to get back to the office, whereas the women are not desperate to get back to the office. Well, why is that? Now, we could say, oh, women want to stay home, da-da-da, more flexibility. But it's not as simple as that. 
what they're talking about is how that is where men's power dynamic is, right? Being in the office, seeing people, da, da, da. They are less uh, comfortable with the idea of the fluidity of people being remote, not being able to necessarily see people, not knowing people are working from nine to five, but maybe a little bit of different hours. And so we're really being faced with this and leaders have to change because it is going to be a war for talent. I mean, honestly, as we see the tsunami, people want something different from their employers right now. Obviously we see with this generation Z, they wanna know that their employers are giving back and doing good. But not only that, they want to know that their employers care about them as a person before them as an employee. Now, I don't know about you, but when I came into the workforce, that was not the case. You know, I mean, the, the leader at the top had the power to, you know, had the power to punish, had, had the information, the position, you know, all that power. And that power dynamic is shifting and leaders and companies have to adapt quickly. So there is definitely a window of opportunity right now. But um, there is a, a, a question from the audience um, asking about how we make, how do we not only take advantage of this window of opportunity, but also how do we make up for lost ground during COVID? Because um, a lot of statistics showed that women were paying the price of, of, of COVID-19. So how can we combine, <laughs> is it possible to combine using making the best of the window of opportunity that is open right now, but also making up for lost ground. Can, can we do both? Can we look backwards and forwards at the same time? My opinion is, and you know, I'm an optimist. I think I have to be when I'm faced with 134 years or 135 years at current rate before we achieve equality. And what I hone in on is at current rate of progress, right? So if the rate of progress changes, we can leapfrog that that will that that 135 year equality gap will shrink right mm -hmm. okay so how do we do that and that there are a number of things that i think are really critical yes we take advantage of this window of opportunity what i know is that yes women have been harmed at greater rates but i think what we have also seen and i said this before is these inspiring examples of women's leadership and i think that what is so important right now is we continue to not hold up that they are, you know, they're incapable of failing, but hold up this new model of leadership that women are bringing forth, right? And talk about how it is critical in times of crisis, but also in times of recovery and resurgence, right? That that model is absolutely needed, right? But I think, you know, I think it is to your point, there is the ability to look forward. Um, while pulling up from behind, both by highlighting that example, but by bringing forth new and innovative voices and ideas. What is, what is interesting throughout history is that it is in our times of greatest crisis that one, we come together at greater rates, right? To solve those problems. But we also come up with the most innovative ideas to move us forward at a faster pace. Because quite frankly, the numbers before, 100 years before we get to equality, that wasn't very good either. So I take this as an opportunity, but yes, we have to move fast. We have to move fast. And I think that men in positions of leadership need to look at how that power dynamic can shift, how they can hold up more women leaders, how they can shift their, you know, their leadership style and, and the power dynamic. Um, but also, I think for women in leadership positions, you know, to continue to be out there talking about that difference that women bring, not better, but different, and why it's so critical right now. Thank you. So um, we're almost out of time. So um, I just wanted to ask one final question, and that is actually, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, Christine, about um, this way that women lead differently as we as, as we've heard today more with more empathy more collaboration um more listening can we do that in denmark is that is there is there also an, a window of opportunity open here in denmark for that kind of should we call it modern 
modern wholesome leadership? Like Elise, I'm an optimist. I'm sure we can do it, but we need to focus on it. And we have to not only talk about it and write nice political statements about it, but we actually have to put into action some various measures. And I think, for example, we have a great number of networks out there. For example, myself, I'm a member of the professional um, a network of professional women um, of color in Denmark. And I have also helped that build in the financial government and finance sector union and network of international members. I think what we should see is that there should be an increased dialogue between uh, companies and these networks and other networks that are representing people that uh, could bring in more diversity and have talks about how do we acti actually execute on these nice policy papers that we formulated, which are, are really great. And I think there has already been some progress in actually formulating these papers. So very good. But now we need to take the next step, which is actually how do we execute? How do we implement all this? And here the networks could be in really good opportunity to have some dialogue about how do we actually do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you to um, all four of you for a very interesting discussion. We could, we could go on, but unfortunately we are already out of time. So um, I would now like to hand over to Cynthia Brown. Uh, she is the public affairs officer at the embassy and she will wrap up. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marie. It was a fantastic discussion. And I have to say it was an inspiration for me uh, personally and professionally just to, to take part in today's events. And I too wish we could continue longer. You know, uh, as, as you mentioned, Marie, I'm Cynthia Brown and I'm the public affairs officer at the U.S. Embassy in Copenhagen. And before we close, I just wanted to round out the discussion with a few thoughts and perspectives that I've gathered from uh, the great discussion that we had, we had here today. And I do want to note that we are among good company in individuals talking about this issue, this very important issue. Just yesterday, Vice President Harris was in Mexico City and she was speaking to female entrepreneurs on this very issue. What can we do to lift up the status of women in our own countries and around the globe? So today's discussion, it's a timely one. It's one that's happening across the globe and at all levels. I mean, I heard amazing things today. I heard words like courage and I heard uh, words like risk, um, words that I, I, I take near and dear to my heart. I think I need more courage sometimes and I need to take more risks. And I think we all do. I think that what Elise said about women, women leading differently and, you know, that difference really is a competitive advantage, I think. It brings value. It brings different thoughts and perspectives. Uh, you know, the whole issue of women, we, we gain power, we give power. I think that that is a, a message that I heard resonate in what um, Vice President Harris said yesterday. Sarah saying diversity versus inclusion. It's an important distinction. It's an important area of focus. Uh, an important area for discussion. And I'm very glad that we had that, uh, that that came up today. You know, we make the world a better place for women and you make it better for everyone. That is exactly something that Sec Secretary Blinken said in March when he was at the International uh, Awards for Women of Courage. So something that I think resonates um, with me from, from the perspective of, of my position here in the State Department. And the fact that they're going back to inclusion, you know, institutions, are they driving inclusion? A very important point to make, and um, I think it's something that we all take need to take back to us um, in our positions and in the organizations that we work with. I'm going to give a shout out to Yulia, who shared an article um, about the State Department and how we're looking at diversity. Um, and within the uh, embassy here, just last week, we had an internal session on diversity and inclusion, and we have another one coming up next week. Um, Marie, you noted that the Nordic paradox, and I have to say, for me, I really appreciated that point coming up and the discussion on that phenomenon. You know, busting the myth, I think, uh, is, is uh, very important for what exactly Lee said, that we have to create cultural change and we can't create that change unless we, are, uh, we know what the state of play is. And Christine, also that 50% of the world population are women. That is an interesting statistic. It's a telling statistic when you layer it with the figures of women in leadership really eye-opening to me. And Peter, I, I really like what you said about we lose out. And I think, you know, financially, professionally, and personally, when we don't have inclusion, an inclusive environment, and a, a diverse representation. So all those things resonated with me today. And then finally, just that last bit that was, uh, was talked about here. Um, how do we make up for lost time? You know, current rate 
uh, does not have to mean the present rate or the future rate. I love that. Uh, it can change and new innovation, uh, new voices, innovation, um, times of crisis move us forward at a faster pace. And I don't think anybody can argue that we're not coming out of a time for crisis. So it seems like I too will be the optimist and think that um, our future rate will be faster than our present rate and our current rate. So before I close, I know it's time to end. I do wanna thank our speakers, Elise, Sarah, Christine, and Peter for sharing your insights with us today. Fascinating, like I said, for me. And um, I wish we could continue. I also want to extend a, extend a thanks to Marie for your excellent moderating of this panel. It was difficult, lots of lots of voices to hear, lots of ideas. Um, so thank you very much. I want to thank the AmCham team and Therese in particular uh, for partnering with us on this event. We look forward to continuing this dialogue, to continuing to uh, address uh, at this question together. Look how we can uh, build those opportunities, increase that pace. So I wanna thank you all for joining us. I uh, hope you have a great rest of the day, evening, perhaps for most of you, uh, some day for others that are joining us on a different time zone. But thank you very much, everybody. It was wonderful. Bye-bye.